Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan. This is by Samuel Tomsek. Uh, Conclusion, Politics and Modernity. In his reading of Lacan, Jean-Claude Milner proposed a brief but provocative reading of what he calls Lacan's anti-politics, an orientation that he carefully distinguishes from simple rejection of politics or political indifference. From the perspective of Freud's cultural pessimism and Lacan's ambiguous position towards revolutionary movements, politics turns out to be radically unsynchronized with the modern universe. Is it a coincidence that, if speaking about the state, democracy, domination, or freedom, politics speaks Greek and Latin, as far as it speaks at all, in most cases it mutters? For Milner, modernity means, first and foremost, scientific modernity, the great revolution in knowledge initiated by 17th and 18th century physics and progressively extended to other fields, including the critique of political economy, psychoanalysis, and structuralism, which mobilized its political weight. After the decentralization of the universe in physics and the decentralization of life in biology, followed the trichotomous decentralization of history, thinking, and language. Milner here rephrases Freud, for whom the scientific revolution is understood correctly only by extending its operations and consequences from the natural sciences to the human sciences, the final revolutionary stage. Freud saw the main achievement of this historical development as the direct undermining of human narcissism, and the goal of scientific modernity in the instauration of an epistemological and political condition for which he proposed the enigmatic, enigmatic description, dictatorship of reason. All this is directly opposed to what is at stake in capitalism, the dictatorship of irrational beliefs and the restoration of human narcissism, the self-love and self-interest that Adam Smith and other political economists took for the foundation of social relations. The lack of synchronicity between politics and modernity comes down to the implementation of economic fictions in politics and the enthroning of economy as some sort of new queen of sciences. Capitalism constructs an economic theocratic order which entirely absorbs politics and science. In this scenario, critical orientations like Marx's and Freud's indeed engage in what Althusser called class struggle in theory, which evolves around the fact that, after the god of religion and the god of philosophers have been pronounced dead, what remains is the god of economists. The abolition of the economic theocracy is the necessary condition for the synchronization of politics with the modern universe. Capitalist democracies claim for themselves the title of political inheritors and responses to the modern scientific revolution. But Marx already drew attention to the fact that the political signifiers of the French Revolution, freedom, equality, and fraternity, were transformed by property and private interest. These political economic signifiers rejected the idea of fraternity and restricted restricted the revolutionary character of freedom and equality through the narcissism of the private. Fraternity, however, <clears throat> fraternity, however, strives to found the social link on a form of philia that Marx had also been aiming at when he described the communist society as an association of free subjects. Freed of the narcissism of private interests, which are, in the last instance, determined by the imperatives of capital. Of course, Marx did not create the illusion that the features of the communist social order could be foretold. What is certain is that such a political project demands rigorous workers, to use Lacan's expression from his founding act of École Freudienne de Paris. In an infinite universe where, where where nature no longer speaks Aristotelian, and scholastic language, but adopts the language of geometry and mathematics. As Galileo wrote, 
politics continues to use dead languages, which rooted in the old t- topology of political space. Both languages also serve as metaphors for the general space of thinking. Aristotle and the scholastics are inevitably associated with the closed cosmological model, the system of spheres that knows no outside, while the language of mathematics immediately connotes the modern infinite universe. To this reading, one could easily object that the main problem of modern politics is not so much tied to dead languages, but to the fact that politics is compromisingly intertwined with a highly problematic living language, commodity language, the language of economic liberalism and neoliberalism, which precisely is modern and no less autonomous as the language of mathematics. From a Marxist perspective, the problem is then not in a hypothetical pre-modernity of politics, but rather in the fact that there is no structure of political emancipation, or as Lacan has put it, no discourse of which the proletarian, this universal subjective position in modernity, could make a social link. Political language was absorbed into the abstract language of economic categories, which consequently led to the reduction of subversive social movements, first to democratic and later to identitarian politics. An even more dramatic failure marked the revolutionary attempts to build a free and egalitarian communist society in which politics exercised structural and real violence under the pretense of abolishing capitalist social relations and reintroducing presumably immediate relations between men, which it eventually did in the form of immediate relations of domination and a state-sanctioned system of terror. Back in the democratic context, identitarian politics pursued the proliferation of minoritarian identities and moved towards the problematic of representation, e.g. gender quotas, which successfully neutralized the language of revolutionary politics. The subject of identitarian politics no less rejects the actual subject of revolutionary politics which is constitutively pre-identitarian, non-individual, and non-psychological, hence irreducible to particular identities or identifications. In the end, identity politics proposes its own version of a narcissistic subject. For the, non, for the non-identical subject of the unconscious, Freud and Lacan argued that it could be discovered only under the conditions and within the horizon of the modern scientific revolution. This means that the subject of modern politics is the subject of modern science, and while politics grounded on the economic and legal abstractions repeats the capitalist rejection of this negative subjectivity, communist politics would have to start from the practical mobilization and organization of the subject that Marx isolated in his science of value. Lacan's reading of Marx insists that his critique comes down to the effort of such theoretical isolation, a materialist theory of the subject, which provides a new orientation of political practice. While capitalism considers the subject to be nothing more than a narcissistic animal, Marxism and psychoanalysis reveal that the subject of revolutionary politics is an alienated animal, which in its most intimate interior includes its other. This inclusion is the main feature of a non-narcissistic love and consequently of a social link that is not rooted in self-love. Anti-politics comes down to an attempt to go against the politics of capital and the democratic politics of human narcissism. Recall Lacan's declaration that the aim of psychoanalysis is the exit from the capitalist discourse for everyone. Indeed, Lacan's take on politics is, despite all the appearances, not that foreign to Deleuze and Guattari's anti-Oedipus. One of the crucial tasks of their versions of the critique of libidinal economy is the liberation of of desire from commodity form. The unique formal envelope of thinking in modernity, by means of which capitalist abstractions colonize the mental apparatus and determine unconscious mechanisms, Lacan's quarrel with the authors of Anti-Oedipus and with the revolutionary students who sought their political inspiration in Reich and Marcuse turned around the signification of this liberation, which comes down to the theory of the subject. 
does the radical political program of liberation necessitate the dissolution of the link between subjectivity and negativity? Should one not rather determine the subject of politics by following Marx's example, when he recognized in the proletariat the symptomatic and negative point from which the capitalist mode of production can be undermined, and more importantly, the impersonal and non-narcissistic foundation of politics can be extracted. A materialist theory of the subject, such as that proposed by structural psychoanalysis and the critique of political economy, is the logical response to the capitalist rejection of negativity. The main political and epistemological contribution of the critique of political economy is worth recalling here. Marx introduced two corrections of classical political economy, which served as the general points of departure in his mature work. The first correction concerns the autonomy of value that political economists mistakenly understood in terms of vital force or positive quality of commodity, money and capital. In other words, they conceived the autonomy in question as an external object. This is what Marx calls fetishism. For the critique of political economy, however, the autonomy in question should be envisaged not as some positive substance, but in terms of logic. Marx's second correction concerns the labor theory of value. Unlike the English economists who saw in labor a source of value, Marx's surprisingly banal yet far-reaching differentiation between labor process and labor power, use value and exchange value, unveils a structural paradox, which is, as such, the driving force of the capitalist mode of production. Labor power materializes the structural gap, which is contained in the commodity form and which becomes the actual source of value. Marx indeed proposes something that one could call a non-relational theory of value. The fact that there is no such thing as a social relation is indeed profitable, for some. Lacan's reading takes a step further by recognizing in labor power the distorted version of the subject of modern science. For both Marx and Lacan, the negative, which again means the non-narcissistic subject, is the necessary singular point on which political universalism should build. The capitalist appropriation of the subject cannot ground any real political universalism, because it places the subject in the position of the object. Transformed into labor power, the subject is turned into one among many things that constitute the immense collection of commodities. The subject becomes human capital. This offabung of the subject and the object is necessarily accompanied by the production of fetishist scenarios and pseudoscientific economic hypotheses which place capital in the position of the exclusive subject of politics. The tendency of capital to self-valorization neutralizes every attempt to ground politics on anything other than private interest, not the private interest of some hypothetical homo economicus, but of capital. From this perspective, Milner's thesis of the pre-modern nature of contemporary politics might turn out to be more Marxist than it seems under the condition that the same reproach can be addressed to capitalism. Capitalism then needs to be thought of as the restoration of pre-modernity within modernity, a counter-revolution that neutralizes the emancipatory political potential of scientific revolution. For Freud, pre-modernity meant to remain in worldviews rather than adopting the revolutionary lessons of modern science. By filling the gaps in reality, worldviews strive to construct a closed world, marked by totality, finitude, and centralization, while the modern universe seems to contain nothing but contingency, infinity, and instability, three features that go against the rootedness of human narcissism in thinking. Capitalism seems to have embraced all of them. Not only did it present itself as the paradigm of, of modernity, We still hear that modernity essentially means capitalist modernity, industrial and post-industrial revolution, which precisely conditions the social process with scientific progress. But also capitalist reality appears as infinite, disclosed, and unstable as the universe of modern science. If modern science abolished the ancient division of the superlunary and the sublunary world, capitalism willingly adopted the scientific thesis. There is indeed only one world, the global market, which brings the stars down to earth, rejecting the divide of social reality 
between a superlunary feudal and religious master and the sublunary serf. Capitalism and science go equally well together when it comes to the permanent revolution of the means of production, which makes the modernity of capitalism unquestionable. But this modernity ceases at the critical point of the subject. In order to account for the existence of the subject, capitalism produces a system of economic, political, and juridical fictions, which strive to conceal the politically subversive and destabilizing non-identity that constitutes the subject, and more importantly, which strive to disavow the impossibility of the integral commodification of the subject. Of course, the instability of capitalism is structural, to the extent that every economic crisis reveals the normal functioning of capitalism. However, the core of the crisis is not so much the incapacity of capitalist fetishizations to regulate the instability of financial capital and the impossibility to provide perspective insight into the spirit of capitalism, but the production of global surplus populations, which personify the return of the rejected negativity. The crisis itself is internally doubled and equiv equivocal. It contains a crisis within the crisis, in which the social masses articulate their rejection of the commodity form as the sole realistic political universalism offered by capitalism. Let us here recall Quare's interpretation of the modern scientific revolution and its Lacanian extension to psychoanalysis. Modernity stands for two groundbreaking effects. One, the abolition of the cosmological division of the higher sphere of eternal mathematical truths and the lower sphere of generation and corruption, where the use of mathematics made little sense for the old episteme. Two, the abolition of, of the hypothesis of the soul, which is replaced by a new hypothesis, that of the subject. Unlike the metaphysical soul, which presupposes the pre-modern cosmologies, the modern subject implies a different topology of thinking, which questions the primacy of the centralized ego. The shared modernity of the critique of political economy and psychoanalysis consists in the fact that their materialist theory of the subject went against the reduction of subjectivity to consciousness or to private interest. From the Marxian and Freudian perspectives, to say false consciousness is to pronounce a pleo, pleonasm, since from in no other consciousness, since there is no other consciousness than false consciousness. In its materialist orientation, psychoanalysis stands in immediate continuity with Saussure's discovery of the autonomy of the signifier, which provided the first modern non-Aristotelian theory of language, and with Marx's departure from the autonomy of exchange value, which developed the first defetishized economic theory. All three sciences provide rigorous demystifications of thinking, language, and value, hence of social relations and of subjectivity. Both autonomies in question provide insight into the structural conditions of capitalism, but in order for capitalism to emerge, the commodification of the subject and the mathematization of the surplus object need to take place. The ambiguity of capitalism resides in this process, in respect to both groundbreaking consequences of modern science. On the one hand, it does seem to pursue the scientific move by quantifying both the subject and the object, but on the, higher, on the other hand, it restores the soul through the feigned hypotheses of commodity fetishism. The capitalist fetishization fills reality with spectral entities and enthrones capital as the vital soul of the world, the highest sphere of the closed capitalist world, from which, as we are told, there is no exit, unless we want to finish in a new barbarism. In this respect, capitalism reinstalled the division in the superlunary sphere, now inhabited by the capitalist abstractions subjected to mathematization, which would ideally provide their future predictability, and the su sublunary sphere were a contingent and non-mathematical interplay of particular interests and political manipulations takes place. 
the highest sphere, financial capital, continues to move all other spheres of human production. One revolutionary feature of modern science, to recall Quare's main thesis, lies in the fact that its use of mathematics no longer sustains the phenomena and is not centralized on the way reality appears to the human observer. This move abolishes the three cornerstones of the ancient episteme, totality, harmony, and regularity, which are not incidentally the three main features that the liberal and neoliberal political economies attribute to the laws of the market, self-regulation, and economic homeostasis. Financial mathematics distorts the structural instabilities and inequalities in capitalism and conceals that capitalist fetishizations cannot bridge the gap between the conglomerate of economic fantasies and political subjectivity that capitalism inevitably reproduces. In opposition to these scenarios, Marx's and Lacan's methods and concepts offer a critical tool which corrupts the ongoing fetishization of economy as a subject supposed to know. In the last instance, predominant economic knowledge contains a conglomerate of irrational beliefs and a systematic strategy to repress the fact that the creation of wealth requires the reproduction of pre-modern relations of domination and subjection. Finally, what does the combination Marx and Lacan stand for? Lacan next to Marx questions the optimistic and humanist readings, according to which Marx's critique aims to break out of symbolic determinations negativity, and alienation. Marx, next to Lacan, questions the pessimistic and apolitical readings, according to which Lacan's reformulation of the structuralist project supposedly amounts to the, re the recognition of the universal madness and autism of jouissance, which dissolve the social links, and to the affirmation of the discursive a priori, which determines human actions and presumably reveals the illusionary, features of every attempt in radical politics. The shared logical and political project of psychoanalysis and Marxism is to, is to determine the terrain in which the subject is constituted and to detach the subject from its commodified form that capitalism imposes on everyone through direct forms of domination as well as through the hyper-fetishization of financial abstractions. Marx and Lacan thus highlight two aspects of modernity that still call for political realization and that map the terrain of political and theoretical struggles for the exit from capitalism. One is the necessity to mobilize the subversive dimension of modern science that Freud so persistently accentuated. Here, the theoretical struggle for the extension of scientificity takes place, a struggle that Quare exemplified in his insistence on the Platonist nature of the modern scientific revolution. Plato against Aristotle, Descartes against Bacon, revolutionary science versus the combination of positivism and quantification. To repeat one last time, for Marx, science could and should amount to the liberation of the laborer from labor, which means the liberation of the subject from the commodity form. For Freud, science could and should suspend human narcissism, which means detaching the subject from the ego and politics from private interest. Science is one of the central terrains of political struggle, precisely because it became the main tool of capitalism against the realization of political modernity. A materialist reading of modern science necessarily includes this, the question of its subject, as Lacan's critical appropriation of epistemological questions constantly demonstrates. The second unrealized aspect of modernity is directly related to the first one and concerns the actualization of the third term that drove the French Revolution. Uh, fraternite, fraternite of fraternity, the enigmatic signifier of communism, which is only possible under the condition that a materialist theory of the subject replaces idealist theories through which the capitalist economy managed to take politics and the entirety of social reality as its hostage. Only then will politics be consistently in sync with modern science and inhabit the same universe.